and then we're going to get straight to the good stuff. Uh, we're going to have Laurie and David and Jane all speaking to us a little bit about what their jobs are. If everyone could mute their mics during the presentation, that would be absolutely awesome. But at the end, we'll have a good Q&A section after our tips bit so that you can actually just speak away to us. Try and make this as casual as possible. Happy to chat and answer any questions. You can also use the chat box that's down the side of your screen. Uh, a few people have used it already today. Uh, we've had people saying hi, so feel free to use it. Um, I've got someone monitoring that for, for giving us uh, the questions at the end so we can actually run through them as well. Anything from the chat box at the side that we don't manage to answer within the presentation, we will email you out the answers uh, later on. Okay. Right, quick overview of Oracle. I'm not going to go on about Oracle. This presentation isn't about Oracle. Just briefly to say that it's been around and started pretty much as a games company back in 2007. Uh, around 2015, when I joined, was a uh, about, there were approximately 19 staff. I think I was only the second lady within the business. Um, and it's grown from 19 staff in the last five years to over 150 staff covering the whole length and breadth of the UK. We even have a couple of staff out in Spain and Greece, which is very, very cool. And one in Poland currently as well. He's stuck there due to lockdown. Uh, back in 2015, we won our first big financial technology client, and that was Clydesdale Bank. And since then, the company has just gone from strength to strength. Lots and lots of digital health stuff, lots and lots of financial technology stuff. These seem to be the two things on which we hang our hats and we do best at. Okay. Heather, can we move on to the next slide? Thank you. Um, over the period, in fact, over the course of the last two years, we've managed to run some academy classes. And that's essentially because we didn't find that there were enough people actually coming out of university and colleges, certainly within Scotland initially, with the correct uh, qualifications to actually work for us straight away. So we thought we'd give people a hand. And it seems to be the case that across the UK, there's the same problems. People aren't necessarily coming out with quite the right qualifications quite the right uh, sort of commercial awareness and tools and skills that you would get within a commercial environment. So I've been incredibly lucky with the people around me. You're going to hear from one of them today, Laurie, who's actually been helping me with the academy and teaching some absolutely fantastic courses. The whole aim of the academy has been to upskill young people, reskill the workforce, and we're really trying to reduce barriers to entering the digital workplace. Um, so far, the things that we've done best, we've tried a few things, but the things that we've done best are offer four to eight week evening courses. They've usually been a couple of hours a week where people have actually managed to build an app within the time. You're going to hear from one of our developers who was a junior developer with us and is no longer one today. And he actually came through that academy course and he can perhaps tell you a little bit about how that went. We're engaging with local schools and DYW to develop knowledge sharing. Uh, we've managed to do internships. Again, David will speak a little bit about that today. Um, and that's been for the best, essentially. That's just bigging him up quite a lot. The best of our students. So he essentially came through the academy, uh, did incredibly well on an eight week course. Um, I'm laughing at the chat bot at the side. Um, did incredibly well on an eight week course, was brought in as an intern and then brought on as a, a permanent member of staff and is now a developer. Recently as well this summer, I'm really proud to say that we've just been doing some work experience remotely uh, for young people, which has been absolutely brilliant, brilliant fun. There are masses and masses of jobs within Oracle. Just because today we're covering development, design and data, I don't want you just thinking that they're the only jobs that are out there within the digital workplace. We've got a huge number of people on this call today who are from all across business all across the university sector, uh, hopefully a few school leavers. So no one should come to this thinking, oh, the only digital jobs are people with uh, for people with computer science degrees. That's not the case. We hope to disprove that. There are lots and lots and lots of jobs. You'll see from the variety I've put up there, and this is not the be all and end all, but there's loads and loads of them available. So there are software developer jobs. There's very specific sort of design and data jobs, and Jane will go into the nitty gritty of those. We've got huge numbers of business growth and support jobs covering sales, marketing, and obviously the kind of job that I do in HR and lots and lots of people who are involved in actually managing projects. You might have not heard the term Scrum Master before, perhaps you have. If you want to ask us any questions about any of these job roles, then feel free to do so at the end of the talk. Okay, I am going to pass on to Laurie, who's going to tell you a little bit about how he's gone from zero to hero with a match of very few years. Off you go, Laurie. Thanks, Angela. Hear me okay, yeah? Yeah, hear you great. 
Okay, firstly, thank you so much, uh, everyone, for joining me today. I'll just start this timer because, you know, I could speak forever if not. Um, it's a real privilege to speak to all of you. Um, and I really, really, really want to try and hit home with some people here who are really want to change and, you know, transition into a career as a developer, which is exactly what I did uh, a while back. And, you know, from humble beginnings, I'm still obviously very humble, but um, I wanted to try and help people um, to get into their dream job because I literally, love what I do so much. Um, I get to make apps every day. My day involves, you know, getting up and leading a team to build really exciting apps in the projects team where we take on experimental stuff. And it's just a great uh, life um, where I can just code and build stuff. It's the most creative job you could ever want. And I get to learn all the time, which is kind of my dream job. If you like learning, you're gonna love being a developer because it's enough learning to <laughs> take you to the very end <laughs> and then some, which is awesome. Um, I arrived at Oracle about two and a half years ago as a senior develop iOS developer. I make iOS apps. And now I'm a team lead for um, the projects team, which is a real privilege. I'm also a teacher on the raywendelite.com uh, website, which is the world's biggest iOS learning website, subscription-based um, service. And you can learn as much as you want on there about iOS development. Highly recommended and take a note of that if you're interested in iOS development. I've also been involved in the Digital Academy where I've seen uh, people come in who didn't even know how to type properly and now they can code, which is amazing. Um, just such a, actually, I still can't type properly either, so I don't know what I'm talking about. Um, but yeah, it's just great to see people not know anything and then actually realize, hey, I can do this, which is my focus for today. I just want to cover then, talking about that, um, what it's like actually being like a dev versus what you might think it is. Um, what is it to be a good one? And hopefully I can represent that well. <laughs> <laughs> um, spoiler alert, maybe not, but how to get there quicker as well is another one I'd like to go over. So that's it for today. So I was asked to put a few images of me on there, so cringe time, you know. Um, but basically, I've got an interesting story, and hopefully I can relate to some people here. Um, I, I always like to say that I couldn't find the semicolon on the keyboard when I started to code. It was so difficult to even find the keys you needed. Um, and you know, I had no idea what I was doing. I had no school experience. Um, I just couldn't, I just had no, you know, just it was just something that didn't relate to me at all. I actually studied music when I was at university. Um, my schooling wasn't great fun. I didn't enjoy school that much. Um, and I went, you know, thankfully for music, I was deeply passionate about um, being a musician. It was my absolute calling in life. And unfortunately I injured my hand um, when I was at university, I still graduated. So it meant I had to kind of drop everything that I had and try and find that thing that would replace music, which for a musician is, is very difficult. What's even more challenging is that some of you may have families or responsibilities. At that time, I had three children and I have five, um, which is interesting. Um, but I had three children and I had two jobs at the time. And my wife was looking after the kids. And I, I suddenly had this idea that I, I wanted to make websites for things. <laughs> Uh, as you do. And I just couldn't do it. It was out of my reach. And I was so frustrated with the fact I couldn't do the things that I wanted to do that could make my life, my family's life better. And I started to try and get into some web development and um, really found it to be the most difficult thing in my entire life. Um, and, you know, in my spare time, I was working in cafes in the weekend if I could grab a quick coffee and study away from the kids. I just tried my very best to do courses, little mini courses. It wasn't the most efficient way of doing it. Um, but very quickly, I managed to sort of, with that, sort of really wanted to change career rather than start a hobby. Um, I found this website called Treehouse, which at the time was a great way to learn web development. And I completed one of their courses so fast that they featured my profile on their website uh, and then got hired shortly after that. Um, I had my first sort of contracting gig where I did little, little web jobs for someone. Uh, and that was my entry into being a developer. But what I really wanted was to be a mobile developer. And many of you are maybe in that area where you're trying to transition. It's just a, how do you get enough uh, skills to get the job? And so I just decided to focus exclusively on iOS. I gave up all that and managed to get my first iOS job. Um, and it's amazing what you can do when you focus on that one industry for a while, because now I teach on the Rewind like, a website, which is a real privilege. But there's still so much stuff that I actually want to do. Um, so. I really wanted to just face this right now, and it's the, the big problem I had, and a lot of developers have, is this, what does a real developer actually look like? You might think you know what that is, um, but devs are like this uh, mysterious, magical entity 
like wizards that you what do they get up to um real full-time devs versus maybe people who have done courses and things and i want to just just <laughs> immediately tell you that um you're always going to deal with that imaginary um, neo from the matrix in your mind you can just you can just do everything um because some developers are astonishingly good and they're just so logical and they can just break things down but my sort of more eccentric personality from a, an arts background it suited me as well because there's all types of developers and we need more different types of people in there and um, we need different types of people because it helps balance pe people out and um, i just want to say that if you're here you've probably got some passion and you actually want to do this off your own back and see if you have passion that immediately puts you in like the top 10 percent of developers i would rather work with a passionate team that wasn't as good than work with people who were rock stars but were a complete nightmare to deal with um, and that's something that you should know because a lot of developers have lost their passion have, have plateaued in their skills and they don't know really what it is they want to achieve so if you know what it is you want you're already got a head start and that's something people really look out for recruiters and in job interviews if you don't have a formal computer science degree i would say that's an advantage to you if you're trying to transition into that um, as an adult and you've already got a job because you've done it yourself and every dev has to go through that regardless of the degree or not and if you've done it on your own it's a huge advantage because you're used to breaking problems down you're solving the problem of your time and how to get that skill set so just give yourself a break and realize this is a really good thing and um, but just the one thing i want to say is that these devs they don't look like the ones that are in your head which are crippling the good and they're better than anything you could ever imagine it's just simple people like me who have got families and, and it's all sorts of personalities there there's good days and there's bad days and we just you know really love what we do but it's a human thing and just when you write code it's not for machines it's actually for people to read uh, and understand and so i thought i would just chat a little bit about uh, what what is what is what it is going to be like when you're a good developer um which is the next slide cool so um yeah so basically i've written here and <laughs> come back to neo you think it's going to be this thing where you wish you could inject it in your mind and suddenly you can just do everything but the reality is is that every day you're not going to know what's going to face you that day and when you first get a job as a developer you'll get small bugs and things and you'll just have to read code base and it's quite overwhelming at first but i've written there that one does not simply learn to code without working as a team and your team will be there for you when you're a junior dev you've got a lot of time to learn ask questions and a junior dev is actually an extremely difficult thing it's not like you're no tasks it's going to be really hard really challenging and it's something you're going to be expected to write which is good code and what is good code you know and there's a lot of code out there especially with uh, less experienced developers and sort of go over what that is and basically it's something that's a creative solution to the problem you're given you're always going to have this problem it's all about problem solving it's got to work it's got to be functional it's got to be maintainable which means someone can come along and fix it if they have to and it's got to be done on time the funny thing about those four qualities there is that's what i want from my team every day it's that's good code it's not perfect typing it's not perfect spacing at all extreme complicated logic it's not at all it's the opposite of that it's something that you can read and understand and it works and the great thing about that is that's not something that you have to be born with it's something that you can just choose to do um you need to actually be passionate enough to choose to do this every day because it's easy to just get lazy and just type stuff and i've done this before but if you're always trying to stay on that edge and stay the best you can, you will do absolutely amazingly well as a junior or mid-level or senior. It's something you have to choose to do every day. And why you're going to do, why your coding is so important, because if you don't have that, you might actually end up just getting bogged down with all there is to learn. Whereas if you can just see it as a, a real joy to constantly be growing, that's something that I've tried to maintain all the time. And when I became a developer, I was shocked to see so many devs that didn't really like to learn on their own time. Um, but if you're doing that now, you've already got a great head start and you should keep that up throughout your career. I'd encourage you to try and meet other developers and see yourself as working in a team because it can be really intimidating just when you step into that first job and you're like, I don't know what I'm doing or, oh my gosh, everyone's so good. But when you're with a team and people are normal, you realize that it's not as scary as it looks. Um, last tip I'm going to give to everyone is, is just developing that zone that you get into. Um, most of us joke that we have coffees and we just suddenly sit there with all this energy and just type with our fingers it's a crazy job but it's absolutely nothing like it and it's just about developing that ability to get in the zone quickly whatever works for you for me it's music because of so much noise with the kids i have a coffee and i can just get 
I can get in the zone and try and solve those problems. Um, so that's what makes good code. Hopefully you can take something from that, but I just want to hit home that it's, as my alarm going off, I just want to hit home that it's basically, um, it's a human thing. I want to try and reach as many people as possible to say that you can transition into that career, regardless of your personality type or what you're like, there's room for everyone. And I just want to really encourage you, if I can help you in any way to do that and make your journey less exhausting than mine was, then I'd love to do that. And that's it from me. Brilliant, thank you very much, Laurie. On to our, our next human coder, definitely human, uh, David, who actually came through the academy with Laurie, uh, teaching him. So uh, he can tell us a little bit about how that went and what he does now. On you go, David. Yeah, that's definitely me in the picture. Um, <laughs> quite close up picture of that. Well, not too sure why I used that one. <laughs> um, I did plan on coming out to some Eye of the Tiger theme music, but I changed my mind at the last minute and thought I would try and remain professional. Um, <laughs> just a little bit of background about myself. I'm 33 from Glasgow, a um, bit of a late bloomer, especially when it comes to being a developer, which I'll, I'll talk about just now. Um, just got some points here that I'll... Uh, Miko's making fun of me, yeah, unfortunately. Um, yeah, so uh, I was going through these points. Um, I probably won't have as much to say as Laurie, but I'll try my best. I'll try my best to match Laurie's great chat. Um, so how did I do at school? Um, I didn't do particularly well at school. Um, I, I scraped through. Um, I left halfway through fifth year without doing any hires because I just didn't really like school too much. Um, I went on to college to do music. Um, which I eventually went and done a degree in music um, and sort of my life after school just consisted mostly of trying to become a rock star, trying to make it big in the music industry. But as I've said many times before, uh, I didn't really have any sort of talent for music. So, um, uh, I sort of uh, bummed about from job to job, offices, factories, um, and being quite honest, didn't really have, have the best time um, you know, in the last sort of five, six years, I've uh, done some traveling um, and I managed to land a job at a charity where I was working uh, at a children's charity. And uh, I met someone who suggested that I get into programming. Um, I've always enjoyed computers. I do a lot of computer games. I, I, I like that, um, everything IT, but I just never really ever imagined that doing programming would be something. I just thought that was something that, super smart like oracles I've done that I just had no idea that that's something that I'd be able to do um but yeah I was suggested that I do an online course I think it was code academy or my free code camp and I started doing a web development course and um, just in a little bit of time some html css some javascript and you know the way that these things are paced that you sort of you learn a little bit and I thought oh, this isn't quite the the rocket science that I thought it was going to be and um, but I still wasn't really 100% sure what I wanted to do, so I ended up, I went to college um, and I enrolled in an NQ in computing when I was 30. And I was like, what am I doing with my life? I don't even know I'm going to do an NQ at the age of 30. Um, but during that course and the, the HNC that I'd done after that, we we done um, web development, software development, and I, I got completely hooked on coding. And I decided, you know, with my age against me, that I was going to try and cut as many corners as possible. So I started to do a lot of online courses on Udemy, uh, Ray Wenderlich, uh, all the free code camps. And I just tried to immerse myself in, in programming all the time. Uh, and, you know, that sort of led one thing to another where I would, you know, meet people. Um, and that sort of, as well as being at college, opened up quite a lot of opportunities to me. <laughs> um, yeah, 30, Nikki, true. I'm 33 now, actually, so. Um, so yeah, um, so what opportunities did I have and how did I grab them? Well, I tried my best to just go for everything, even things that I didn't know that I was going to get. I went to, to meetups and um, I applied for world skills, even though I didn't know if I would get in. Um, I eventually didn't get to do it because I had to leave college because I was offered a job. Um, I would go on LinkedIn and, and I would write blogs about what I was learning and uh, I would try my best to, to just put myself out there and make my own, myself a presence online and I would comment on things and, and you know I would always reply to recruiters and, and tell them what my situation was and stuff like that um, 
and that sort of led me to having the opportunity to study at the Oracle Digital Academy. Uh, they ran a six weeks course in iOS development. I'd never looked at a line of uh, Swift, which was a language that we learned. I'd never looked at it before in my life. And when I realized that I had that little opportunity there, I, I decided I was going to grab it with both hands. And uh, I'd done a, an, an online course in Swift at the same time. I bought a course on Udemy. Um, and I pretty much crammed as much into that six weeks as possible, um, as well as build, building my own app um, at the end of the course. Um, thankfully, Oracle were, were impressed, um, which takes me to the next point, is how did I arrive at Oracle? Um, from that, uh, Oracle offered me a three-month internship, which um, I grabbed again with both hands and, and both feet, <laughs> uh, because at that time I was doing an HNC and web development, and. I uh, decided again with my age against me that I was going to try and you know make that transition as short as possible. Um, I done a, an internship with Oracle, which was amazing. Um, I came in and I got to learn every day. That they set aside uh, time for me to to learn every day. Yeah, I think the, when I came in, they had made me a schedule of you know you're going to be in this team for a couple of days, that team for a couple of days, and then you're going to learn um, on your own, and that that. That environment and, and the pace of that was, was, was really, really good for me. Um, I, I learned a lot in that time. Um, the only thing was that with me totally just in the zone all the time, that I had to kind of speed that up. So I managed to get put into uh, one of our teams. Um, and that's when I started working with developers every day. And um, that, again, takes me to the next point, which was, what's it like being in a developer? Um, at first, it's kind of scary. You're... you're Surrounded by, in my opinion, at Oracle, that the best developers in the country. They're, these these guys are absolutely outstanding, and it can be a little bit daunting, uh, daunting at first. So, um, what you start start to realise though is that that there's not there's no ego that involved there. Um, there's everyone there just wants to help you. They 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 see you struggling, and they see you as being new, and and they they love to help, and they they want to give you the best advice that they can, and um, you know, I was very lucky that, you know, I'd maybe write some code and I would show it to, you know, one of the more senior developers and, and they would help me to refactor it. They would show me better ways to think about code. And that's something that I don't want to, uh, I don't want to put down education too much, but that's something that you really get when you go out to work is, is you know, this kind of work experience is, is, is completely underrated. And I think that it helped me massively. Um, the best thing about working at Oracle is, again, it's just the support that you get. Everyone looks after you. you you're rewarded for, for being passionate. They, you know, there's all these opportunities that open up to you. I got to go and speak at colleges and universities. I, one of the first things I wanted to do when, when I got hired was was to get involved in the Digital Academy because that was something that, that really, really did help me. And um, the best piece of advice that I can give anyone who's a new developer or would like to be a developer is just to grab all these opportunities available to you. There's there's so many people out there, so many great people that really want to help you and will do their best to, to offer you advice and, and steer you in the right direction. And, you know, they might, might not always work, might not always go somewhere, but, you know, you'll get that one chance. And when you get that one chance, you have to be ready to take it. Um, yeah, and that's me. Thanks very much. Brilliant, David. Thank you. That was fantastic. Okay, we're on to Jane next to give you a bit of a, a design and data uh, perspective rather than just focusing on development because this is another piece of what Oracle do. Jane, you ready to go? Yeah. Uh, so, hi, my name is Jane. Um, my actual job title is a UX analyst, which we got from a job title generator um, because what I do is a bit weird. Um, when I was at school, I was a complete and utter teacher's pet. Like, if there was an extra bit of homework that could be done, I would do it. Um, I did really well at school. I kind of didn't have any problems with it. Um, I always, when I was at school, was kind of stuck between three different subjects. I was doing music and geography and computing. Um, I didn't have much of an option with computing because my auntie was my teacher. so. <laughs> wasn't allowed to drop it. Um, so when I went to uni, I actually started off doing a geography degree because I had it in my head that I was going to be a town planner and that was my dream. And then after about semester one, I realized that, that I didn't want to. <laughs> um, 
So after my first year doing geography, I actually dropped out of uni and did a summer um, course so that I could jump into the second year of a computing degree. Um, <laughs> um, that summer course was all about um, Java, which I have never touched again. Um, it was all about trying to teach, you know, show that you could learn how to program quickly because um, the course I did was less focused on this, your traditional computer science of which type of sorting is faster and more focused on how many languages can we throw at you. I think in the three years I did the degree, we did 14 different languages spread across different sectors, um, which on the one hand, I remember none of them, and on the other hand was quite good because it taught you that you had to pick things up quickly and you started seeing patterns between languages and if you could do it in one you could probably figure it out in another. Um, the downside was that I'm not a particularly good developer. I didn't enjoy it. <laughs> I just was kind of doing it for the sake of doing it. Um, I actually managed to do my entire fourth year um, honours project without writing a line of code and still passed. I, I did well. Um, they never actually said in the uh, like brief that you had to write it, so uh, that's on them. If they wanted us to build it, they should have put that in the um, specifications, because I will read them. Um, after my degree, I kind of didn't know what I wanted to do, so I just didn't leave uni and stuck around for a master's in user experience engineering, um, which is all about working out what people want from products, digital products in this case, but like what people want from them and how to then design what people want so that they use it. Um, after I left the masters, I couldn't get a job in user experience because you get kind of stuck in this problem where people want graduates, but they want graduates to have three years experience in a portfolio, which I didn't have. All I had was a, my master's project, which was um, for a care home, designing an app for the care home staff to track where their residents were so that they could allow the residents to have like free use of the facility. They had gardens, grounds, um, and they had a lot of residents who didn't need a lot of care. They were more living in kind of um, assisted, um, supported living rather than being cared for. The downside was out, right outside the care home's front door was a bus stop. And if people, if people were to leave the care home and get on a bus, you might not be able to find them again. So we designed a system using RFID key fobs that if an at-risk resident were to leave the facility, it would alert all the staff, which was great because it meant the staff didn't have to worry about basically keeping track on the residents and the residents who could had free use of the building. Um, so after I left, I worked as a web developer for four years. Um, at a company who made those little black boxes that go in your car to get cheaper card insurance. Uh, we were building the web portal for the four largest um, car insurance firms in, in the USA. Um, I enjoyed it, it was a fun job, but I just, again, the problem was I wasn't a particularly good developer. <laughs> so I took a chance on a job advert from Oracle and went for a quick chat with no portfolio, no kind of experience and was very very kindly hired um as at the time what we call a ux developer so i kind of did half design half building um which was great and then eventually transitioned into full-blown ux design after about a year can we get thank you um so sort of for me and my kind of weird half made up job there's no normal day um, I'll start the process of designing an app by running a series of workshops with clients, basically working out what it is they want their product to be. Um, we then take that away and look at different flows of an app. And that can be simple things from how does someone log into this or how does someone complete a task? How does, if you think of like Facebook, how do you add a friend? We'll build all those flows. We then go away and work on the kind of look and feel. So that's the kind of making it look good side that I'm also not very good at. Um, we'll look at brand colors, um, color theory. There's an awful lot into involved with making things blue, makes it look calm and 
um, trustworthy. Orange is meant to be innovative, so we'll use all our knowledge around that and try to come up with what we think the app should look like. And then we work with the developers to make sure that what was designed is what comes out the other end. There's sometimes um, clients will try to sneak things in when the developers are building it. They go, can we just add in? And we have to go, no, you can't just add in because we've spent a lot of time researching all this. You can't just throw something in at the development stage because the poor developers then have to go build it. Um, and then we have to work out what it's meant to do. And um, then once the app's built, I work with their kind of like post care um, post launch team, creating reports on how people are using the app, how many downloads it's had, how many people keep using the app um, after a week, um, a month, a year. Um, and then based on the analytics data we get out of that, making suggestions for new features we could potentially add in. So we're seeing an app like Facebook and people keep posting about parties they're having, we'll add in an events feature to help people plan that. Um, and thanks to sort of the way that I work, I'm based currently looking after eight of our live apps that I work with those clients basically on a day-to-day -day basis, having calls, meetings, sending reports, adding in new features, new bits of tracking. Um, and they're kind of those apps are kind of my little babies and I get to look after them, which I love. So also I get to look at a lot of spreadsheets, which I also love. So <laughs> it's, it's pretty good. So yeah, that's me. Thanks, Jane. That was brilliant. I almost feel like we should have put you before the developers, but then you finished off with what comes after development as well. So it still works. Brilliant. Thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, so what we've done is we've, we've rounded up our top tips. We'll have a wee chat with you about these now, um, and then you should feel free to ask some questions of us afterwards. Um, so some of these are mine, some of them are Laurie's, some of them are Jane's, some of them are David's. So guys, you feel free to jump in whenever you feel the need. Um, I've sort of said, find what you enjoy and identify where your interests lie. You've hopefully had a little flavor of the different jobs there are at Oracle and the different jobs there are in digital, but there are so many more jobs probably jobs that we haven't even thought about yet. I did a presentation this morning with my daughter on robotics engineering and some of the stuff she was talking about is a job that just doesn't even exist yet, but it's out there and she's decided she's going to get it. The boys have really, really covered this, really, really important. Try free courses online wherever possible. Laurie, David, do you want to just mention again some of the actual places where you found those courses? Uh, yeah, so I'll let David jump in as well here. Um, for iOS specific ones, the raywindalick.com website, they have just launched even more free courses to help people who are trying to change career and it's all tied with the kind of current COVID situation to help people who, you know, literally can't do it. So it's got a great starting course, it's totally free. Um, there's also um, udemy.com, which is a great website for more general uh, courses at about £10 each course. And there's some great reviews on there, you can pick the one you want and it covers every kind of software engineering you could imagine. Um, there's great courses by a guy in there called Rob Percival. That's what I would recommend. Brilliant, thank you. David, do you want to add anything else to that one? Sure. Um, I just copy Laurie. I just copy his work. I copy his, his mental attitudes. Um, pretty much just get him to do the work for me, to be honest. No, I'm kidding. Um, yes, same as Laurie. I, I think try them all. Most of these sites, free code camp, but, um, you know, Ray Wendelik, uh, even even Udemy to an extent have um, some free from free things there. The, all the courses are kind of paced differently, and some of them are very data intensive. Some of them are very code intensive. Some of them are quite interactive and, and have little challenges and stuff like that. Um, I, I have done Rob Percival, who who was um, he's actually really really good. He explains things really really well. I need things explained to me like I'm a five year old. So the best thing to do is, is to go and find the, the kind of courses that's right for you. Um, Feel free to get in touch with myself on LinkedIn. Um, I, I'm sure I can say the same for Laurie, Angela, Jane, anyone. Uh, feel free to add us. You can ping us and ask us anything at all that you want. Um, and yeah, there, there's there's a lot of information out there. I think just finding the right, right one for you um, is, is is probably the best way to go about it. Rewind the best for iOS, though, if that's what you want to do. Brilliant, thank you. You'll see the way my mind works, incidentally. I obviously go down rather than across because one, two are across the way and I've gone one, three. So apologies, but I'm still gonna keep going down the list. I can't help it. Um, create an online presence. Um, 
as a as a sort of recruiter in my previous sort of position within Warracle, we look at LinkedIn loads. We look at social media loads. Um, there are lots and lots of things you can do. You cannot get a digital job these days unless you have a digital presence. I think that's a really, really important tip. Jane, do you have anything to add about online presence? Yeah, I think this is like online presence is really important, especially if you're wanting to get into a non-development role where you're often like you don't know how to show off your skill set. I mean, when I interviewed, I didn't have a portfolio, but I did have a blog that I'd basically been adding content to whenever I was bored at my dev job. Um, and it was a lot of very kind of standard posts around um, some like psychological theories and color theory and um, me redesigning an app for Tesco because I can never find Harassa paste, um, which is to this day my top visited page. So <laughs> I need to monetize that. Um, but having something like that that you can point to and say, well, if you want to know more, this is me. Um, and if you Perfect. don't have any development knowledge or you don't have any web development knowledge or don't want to build your own website because let's face it every developer's website is the worst thing they've ever built because you'd never have time um, even just going on something like medium or wordpress.com or one of these like platforms that you can just use you know everyone does it no one's going to look at you going oh you're using a, a site builder that's not very good because we all do so might as well just go for it. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, still reading down the way, I apologize to the man who put this presentation together for me and did a great job. Um, focus on essential skills for your industry. Laurie, I think that's your one, isn't it? Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, it's maybe a bit controversial, but it's it's uh, tempting to just go from industry to industry, like web development, front end, back end, iOS, and try a bit of everything. Um, I would say that to, to get your, if you really want to get hired quicker, it's good to kind of focus on one area of the industry and the kind of essential things. So for iOS, you can find like a roadmap of things that would be good to have. And usually once you start down that road, you can kind of tell if you like it enough to maybe change to something else. But um, if you want to get hired on iOS stuff, then you'd, you'd want to focus, focus on that. And there's some great free kind of roadmaps out there for web development, front end, back end, Android, iOS, and it can, it can help you follow the things that are good to know otherwise you're kind of shooting in the dark and it's not as effective and you'll probably exhaust yourself so stick to the kind of industry skills and you'll get there quicker i think i think that's a fair point and, and laurie and i had an argument about this yesterday which is why he's saying it's maybe controversial um but you know looking at jane's story for example you sort of specialized in one area and it got your foot in the door and then you've ended up developing your career completely differently um i've done the same thing i came from a completely different background however i've ended up in this digital space uh so actually you know doing one thing getting your foot in the door with whatever skills you have and then growing them fantastic it works for people and actually that's uh, point eight as well which is specializing now to get your foot in the door uh, number nine, benefits of blogging. Um, that was also Laurie's. I think Laurie's blogged quite a lot and David blogs quite a lot. So if you guys wouldn't mind stepping in here, that would be great. David, you want to go for it? Sure. Um, just a point on, on the previous point as well. No problem. I, I specialised quite extensively in JavaScript. I was doing all those courses that I spoke about online, which were mm -hmm. JavaScript courses. But the skills that that gave me to, to, to find how to focus, as Laurie mentioned, and and to, and to really focus yourself into one thing when, when the chance came to to then switch that. So I've kind of done a bit of both. I, I jumped into a, another discipline and then I focused all my energy on that. Um, so I think there's there's lessons to be learned on both of them. You can, you know, focus on one thing. You're probably going to have more chances of getting hired because that is a specialist industry, but also, you know, be, be adaptable because things change, especially in this industry, very quickly. Um, and, and what's in demand today might be completely not in demand tomorrow. So, um, That's a really um, good point. There's there's frameworks around at the moment, uh, like React.js, that I don't think were around in 2015. So things are changing consistently, aren't they? That's true. Um, uh, on, on blogging, um, this again was, was advice that I took from Laurie, that, that if you... If you write down and you blog, or you know, in, in some way, um, even if you don't have the, the confidence to, to put that out there live, is is writing down and taking notes and and, and writing it to yourself in a way that you understand is, is a great way to to actually reinforce the the uh, the topics that you're learning 
and, and the things that you're that you're learning. If you can if you can write it down in a way that you think someone else will be able to understand it, then that shows that you can understand it. And blogging helped me massively when I first started. Um, and on top of that, one of the one of the articles that I wrote got something like five thousand reads or something like that. And and I got quite a lot of people that followed me and stuff because um, it, it was a topic that was quite difficult, but also um, I explained it quite well. So yeah, that's definitely a great way to. To, to, to boost your learning and your profile at the same time. Can I just jump on this, please? Yeah, All right, sorry. It. Right, David and I chatted about this yesterday, right? And I really, if I can give any advice to anyone here today, right? I know it seems so few people take this advice, okay? Like 1% of devs blog, okay? If you want to get a job quicker, if you've got a blog, it's better than a CV, okay? Even if no one reads it, because it help, it shows that you know enough that you could, we can, I can very quickly get someone's level from their blog and go, yeah, they're good for the job. If they've got a blog on their CV, I'll go to it and check it out and say, yeah, that's the fine, you know? Rather than you're kind of forcing it on the tech test then and just on your CV, you're giving yourself more bullets in your gun, basically, and it, it helps you learn quicker. I always say you can't afford not to blog. If you, you don't have enough time not to blog, if you don't have a lot of time, basically, because it makes you learn so much faster. And I know it's nerve wracking. I mean, David's first blog got published like worldwide for some reason. <laughs> it was ridiculous. Um, and he, 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 he was just sort of learning it. It was great. Um, but it's not about that as such, but even if you just put something out there on your LinkedIn, people start to follow you and people start contacting you. Uh, recruiters contact you. That's how I got my first job was through the blog. So that's my advice. Sorry. Thank you. No, no, that's great. And actually that ties back into creating an online presence. There's no point in being digital industry if you haven't got a CV that shows off that your online presence is there as well. And you might not even be found in the first place unless you've got an online presence. So go for it. Blogging's great. Um, David really covered this really well, so we won't harp on too much about it. Don't be afraid to ask questions of absolutely everyone. I think, especially at Oracle, we're, we're all very, very approachable, and I would always ask people to, to just ask questions. No questions, stupid. Do you want to add anything to that, David? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, I asked in the beginning, I asked questions to everyone about everything all the time. Uh, I think one of the big problems, with especially with new developers, is... They're, they're, they're either afraid to ask because they don't want to look stupid or they have some sort of, I, I could even include myself in this, is they have some sort of ego that they want to feel like they, they know the answer or they don't want anyone to think that they don't know the answer. And that's that that can be quite harmful. And I think that the best thing to do is to just leave your your ego and your pride at the door and just say, okay, I'm completely new to this and, and learn from the people around you. And the best way to do that is just to ask questions. What you will find um, when you start doing that is, not only will you learn really quickly, but you'll also start to learn when to ask questions and, and how to ask questions. Um, and, you, and you'll develop really quickly a, a way of um, understanding, you know, when it's appropriate to ask questions, because sometimes it's, it's better to struggle and figure it out by yourself. Um, but again, um, yeah, ask questions all the time. I, I would go down and speak to the designers and ask them how they've done things. I would I would just ask everybody everything about what they've done. Um, because it, it makes you a better person to work with as well. Um, as Laurie said in his, his slides before, that you can't do it on your own. You have to do it as a team. And, and the best way to do that is, is just to, to to be chatting to each other all the time. Jane, asking questions does really make you part of the team, doesn't it? Yeah, um, especially now that we're all remote, like the, there's definitely been a, a quick uptick in how many questions people are asking. And it's great because it means that you are very aware of what's going on um, in other bits of the company. Um, we've got like separate um, group chats set up for kind of um, broad, like overarching topics that'll affect multiple teams. And there's constantly questions going on in there, there about, have you guys done this before? Did you find a solution? Um, and it's all about that sort of sharing the knowledge around the people. And some of the questions people ask like are, pretty, are quite sort of basic, but the, the good point about that is the senior devs might know how to ask them or a senior dev might you know, go, actually, do you know what? I can't remember how to do that. And that more basic question is used as a great sort of refresher for the senior dev. The junior dev gets to learn it and everyone else gets to share in that level of knowledge, which is great. And certainly for design as well, that like we are constantly asking each other questions you'll someone will put up a uh, mock-up for an app and you go why have you done it like that did you think about this have you done it like that why is that button there and it's 
not it not only helps explain your choices but it helps you revalidate what your choices were it's like well i made that like that because of xyz it's great brilliant thank you that's super um ask for work experience even rem remotely this works to give you an overview of a role or a company we've offered work experience uh to two separate people over the last few weeks um, one of them, Anna, uh, actually shared with us her work experience on a video. Uh, you can find that on our website. Um, and it was great to manage to do that remotely. I think the reason we were able to do that is because we're used to working remotely. So we were very lucky given the current situation, uh, but also because of the tools we use. So if you do manage to get work experience, you will learn about tooling for companies like ours. And I think it can be anything from Slack to Trello to Jira. There's an awful lot of things that are maybe softer skills that you actually can learn. Uh, Claudia's just very helpfully put up the, the little video clip of Anna's video on the chat box at the side, and we can send that out with the, um, the, the email at the end of this. Um, we're also, uh, we've just given an internship to someone who did work experience in the last few weeks as well. And that's someone who's come from an ethical hacking background, and he's ended up doing a summer internship for us. Uh, if he follows David's pathway, you never know he might be in for a job. <laughs> Be the same sort of uh, thing all over again uh, although he's still fourth year to do at uni and i think he plan he's planning on staying um meet developers go to conferences and free meetups uh even from uh, uh my point of view my perspective going along and meeting people which is not something i was ever particularly good at uh, makes a massive difference actually just speaking to people and finding out about their experiences and putting yourself out there even if you're a little bit of an introvert, and actually a lot of uh, people within the industry are quite introverted, uh, it makes an, an absolutely a huge difference to how you're perceived and to what you find out about. Laurie, do you want to add anything to this? Yeah, so this is hilarious. Like every developer is a horrendous introvert, basically, yeah. um, on some level, right? Um, but the thing is, is that some of you are going to feel like you're faking it to make it, right? But a great chance to do that is to go to like a meetup uh, and meet other devs and you'll see everyone's faking it <laughs> and they're all desperate for a job and the thing is once you've done that a few times you'll realize that you actually get hired on potential as a junior developer rather than on how good you are and part of that's being able to talk if people after usually after most tech interviews someone wanting to speak to you and say even if you can do the tech part can they, are they okay to chat to you? i mean we've got to have a laugh with this person five days a week and things get stressful and things so you, you guys are already have that in abundance in some level so that should give you some confidence it's just to go there and just chat and see, you know what, I can kind of do this. You know, it's it's not an impossible thing. So I uh, just embolden you to go to some meetups and just that's what they're there for. They're usually recruitment events disguised as ways of finding potential junior developers. <laughs> so yeah, go Absolutely for it. Absolutely correct. Yes. Or or uh, they're, they're obviously used to find clients and things as well. But uh, as Mikolaj has just said, there's usually free pizza and beer. There certainly has been at pretty much all of our meetups, I think um specialize we've said that already to get your foot in the door um follow people companies and groups that interest you i uh, follow a lot of people on linkedin i encourage people to follow me uh, it helps me know what's going on guys would you actually like to step in on this last thing jane anything to say about following people is there anyone you specifically follow at the moment that's actually been quite useful to you um actually yeah so i have a, a giant twitter list of um it's specifically women in tech in scotland um i try to keep it quite specific because tech is large um but there are so many people out there who are doing fantastic work so i bring up my list because it's very long but from that list of people who i don't know i just know them on twitter um and I've interacted with them. I got invited to be on a podcast. I've been invited to different um, meetups and events and doing talks. There's a lady who goes by the handle lost underscore semicolon, who is fantastic. She's a developer um, in Glasgow who runs a conference, a podcast, and a bunch of other meetups trying to help people get into the industry. Um, there's also, um, Nizza, who goes by The Real Nizza, which is a fantastic Twitter handle, um, who is just fabulous. And they're always posting blog posts, retweeting other people, um, and they're also really lovely, which is also a plus. I'm a kind of hardcore anti-LinkedIn person, so I'm just like 100% Twitter. <laughs> Fair enough. I don't do Twitter, which is dreadful, but I'm sorry <laughs> about that. Uh, the good thing I think about um, us, 
as a company, seeing people following us is we quite often get to know your names over and over again, and we know you want jobs with us. So it works to follow companies. There's a, a young man here today, I'll not name him, but he's been trying to get a job with us for a while, and he's at every single one of these and very impressed by him. So I, <laughs> I'm keeping an eye on him, and I think he knows who he is. Okay, we're going to pass on now to uh, just a quick Q&A session. Um, I haven't seen, I don't think, very many questions come up in the chat box at the side. Karen, have there been any that I've missed? No, no. Oh, no, so somebody has just asked a question, sorry. So there's one here that says, how many oh. do you have? How many do you plan to hire this year? You're welcome to speak now. You don't actually have to put them in the chat box, but um, it just, it absolutely depends. So I, funnily enough, I had a look at our numbers. We've actually hired uh, five permanent staff while under lockdown. That puts us in an incredibly good position. It's great. Um, they've not necessarily been developers. They've perhaps been marketers or salespeople or whatever. Um, but we do, we do continue to plan to hire. If we win work, we will then go on and we will hire people. That's the way it goes. We're always looking for talent. We're always looking for junior developers, junior designers, people who could come in at any point in the business. Um, so I can't give you a specific number, but we do hope to keep growing. Next question. Anybody want to just speak? It's absolutely fine. Feel free to turn up here, turn off your mic. Um, turn on your mic even. Somebody else has just asked, um, what makes a blog impressive for a potential employer? Laurie or Jane, would you like to answer this? Um, yeah, I'm happy to jump in. Um, personally, um, just someone actually doing a blog already makes you stand out. You would, wouldn't believe how low the bar actually is in terms of communication skills and a blog. <laughs> um, that, that'll pretty much get you in a good position. Um, I would say that find out the important things that are going to be the, the kind of entry level tasks you would be expected to do as a developer in your industry. So on iOS, it's quite easy to find that out. You can find what the the job skills would be and if you're blogging about learning that then that shows me you already know like i don't need to ask you that question um so it means in the interview i won't be asking you things you already know and we can talk about other more interesting things um so even just use medium.com which is a completely free website and it's got a huge audience um you can put your posts on there share them on linkedin or twitter whatever you want to do um, and just making it public with some good quality stuff that you learn on there that is impressive in itself Mm -hmm. That's brilliant. And actually, the very, very good advice there is yes, please make sure you're blogging about things that are, are going to be useful to your job. Again, there's this idea that really you should be talking about stuff that you're wanting to specialize in. I wouldn't start blogging about politics, religion, anything that's got absolutely nothing to do with your job. Steer away from that if you would like a job. <laughs> Okie doke. Next question. Has anybody got another one? Um, so there's one from Graham here. So um, any recommendations, top tips for getting into the project management side of the business for someone coming from a non-tech sector? Um, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll take this to some extent. So it's probably advisable if you're from non-tech sector to start looking at the odd course that you might be able to do. And Graham, if you send us over an email, um, and actually if you email Karen, who's the person speaking, we can then get back to you and give you a few t hints and tips from one of our own project managers. Um, we have people who've moved into project management at sort of very, very junior levels, and also into being a scrum master, very, very junior levels. Um, they tended to get the absolute basic scrum master qualification. They tend to be able to use things like a JIRA board. Laurie, can you help me out? Can you can you add a few points? About the project management side? Yeah. Getting a good project manager is very difficult. <laughs> 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 um, it's, it's such a difficult job in the tech side because it's probably all communication skills and you're making up for all the devs and semi-autistic uh, tendencies where they can't actually talk about the problems. So um, if you're good at juggling uh, people and people who are not great at communicating, then you'll do really well, um, which most normal people are, I suppose. Um, yeah, and, that's and Laurie, good... tooling wise, what, what kind of stuff do, do project managers need to know about that they could perhaps learn so that when they come along, they could say, I already know about this? Yeah, uh, we use um, we use uh, Jira exclusively, really, um, where you're going to do all the management stuff. Although there's other tools out there, but Jira is the one we use because it works well with, you can see it ties in with our like integrations where we're releasing apps and set websites and things. And everything's tied in and you know knowing how to use that generate the 
the kind of client expectations from the burn downs and things and making the tickets and refining those with, with the developers. That's a, that's a good one. Great. Jane, do you have anything to add? I see you've got your mic on. Um, just from the, this is maybe less, less about the project management specifically, but for a non-technical tech job, um, I think the biggest thing that you can do is blogging, like we've said before, like if you're going to do things like a Scrum Master course, just write about your experience doing it. And then when you go to an interview, the recruiter will have looked at it if you've got it publicly available. Um, and joining things like um, subreddits on Reddit that are specific to that, like the, um, I'm in the project, I'm actually doing a project management course right now. I wouldn't recommend it as a course, it's not good. <laughs> But I joined the project management subreddit and that's filled with really hyper specific questions about Jira setup that I do not understand and new people asking questions and everyone is really supportive and will answer it. You're, no one's going to say that it's not like Stack Overflow where you, the question just gets closed because it was asked six years ago. They'll all reply, they'll all be really supportive and will point you towards resourcing. Um, so definitely see if you can find Reddit's a good one for um, communities, but there's a bunch of other ones on Medium or dev.to, which is another kind of like tech blocky, bloggy um, site, but it has much more community focus and, and loads of people asking questions as well. Brilliant. Thank so you, Jane. Um, I think what I might do, just, just sort of thinking about this, this has been quite a tech-focused talk, so perhaps a tech-job-focused job a talk. Uh, perhaps later in the summer, uh, once we've all had a wee break, we could maybe do some sort of project management and other jobs within uh, Warracle, actually cover a few different jobs that aren't so tech-focused, um, and then you'd be able to come along to them and, and find out a bit more about what it takes to be a project manager, scrum master, somebody in quality assurance. There's all sorts of other jobs within uh, development and computing software that actually we've not covered today. Uh, do we have any more questions? Um, yeah, so we've got one um, from Mary there at the side. It says, as agent issue, I'm in my early 40, 40s, will there be opportunities? I mean, straight off the bat, I'll say no, but you can expand on that if you want, Angela. Like, but... Karen, do you want to expand on it? Karen's one of our recruiters um, and, and she sort of regularly sifts through CVs. Yeah, not at all. Doesn't matter how old you are, <laughs> at all in the slightest. It's about the way you come across, your experience, the way you are. It doesn't age doesn't make a difference at all in the slightest. Yeah, so I mean, I... at all. It's all to do with how you are and where the experiences lies as well. It's nothing to do with that. Great. So I've what? moved career several times, and I didn't come to this until my very late thirties, which tells you how old I am now. Um, so no, it absolutely doesn't matter. I think David gave a really good example. He didn't come to computing until he was 30. You can do anything these days. It doesn't matter your age. And we've got people in the business. I think the youngest person in the uh, within Oracle is 23 and the oldest is 63. So we've got quite a good age range there. Any further questions? Um, Jordan's asked, will there be a JavaScript Academy anytime soon? Uh, we would hope perhaps to run one, but it may be as far away as next year. Um, I, I Sadly, uh, we don't lose people very often, but Danny, who, who ran our last JavaScript Academy, is no longer with Oracle. Um, he's still a great mate, and perhaps we could run something uh, in conjunction with him. Uh, so let me look into that. And if it's possible, we could run it remotely. Laurie ran a very successful four-week remote course a few weeks ago, specifically in iOS. It went really, really well. Um, so there's nothing to say that we couldn't run something remotely again. We don't actually to, you know, physically have to be in a room with you, which is great. It makes life a lot easier. So let me look at that um, and I will come back to you. And I like the fact you were a forklift driver until 29. <laughs> okay, any other questions that I've missed? I can't see any more there, Angela. All right, that's Let's super. See. Thank you very, very much for coming along. Uh, we've got another um, event on the 23rd of July. Karen, do you know what that's actually called? Sorry. Um, it is called, bear with me. Uh, Developing company culture. Brilliant. So um, in, the, in the chat there at the side, just if you guys want to have a look at it. 
that's super. Okay, thank you so much for coming. If you want to pop anything else into the side, that's great. We will uh, screenshot all of that, so we'll have these questions. Who won, David's asking. David, you were obviously the best. 